Good evening, and welcome to the fifth lecture by Professor Don Browning in his series, Psychology, Spirituality, and Psychotherapy Toward a Revived, Revived Religious Humanism. The lecture series is sponsored by the Center for the Study of Religion and Psychology at the Danielson Institute under a grant by the Metanexus Institute of the Templeton Foundation. I'm Robert Neville, the director of the Danielson Institute and professor of philosophy, religion, and theology at Boston University. Don Browning is the Alexander Campbell Professor Emeritus of Ethics and the Social Sciences at the University of Chicago Divinity School, where he took his own PhD. Professor Browning is the author of a great many books and articles. His book, A Fundamental Practical Theology, defined that field for his time as Schleiermacher did for his time. He has written on the interface of psychology, spirituality, and theology since the beginning of his career, and the topic of these lectures has been a lifelong interest. Most recently, he has developed collaborative research in religious studies to a high art, completing a very well-funded multidisciplinary project on the family. The collaborative project at Boston University, of which this lecture series is a part, owes much to Don Browning by way of precept and example. Professor Browning's lectures have been or soon will be placed on the internet and can be accessed through Boston University's BU Universe or through the Danielson Center for the Study of Religion and Psychology. Three lectures were given in October. This afternoon, his lecture was entitled Religion, Science, and the New Spirituality. This evening's lecture is Mental Health and Spirituality. They're institutional embodiments. And please come back tomorrow evening for the final lecture in the series, Institutional Ethics and Families, Therapy, Law, and Religion. So please welcome Professor Browning for Mental Health and Spirituality, Their Institutional Embodiments. Well, let me say again how um, much fun and how I've um, gained so much from um, doing these lectures, especially at this stage in my life. As I said this afternoon, it's given me a chance to do both retrospective, catching up in the present, and thinking about the future in ways that um, one needs to do at certain points in one's life. So mental health and spirituality, their institutional embodiment, essential to a viable religious humanism, those of you who may be attending the lectures for the first time, is something I've been talking about a lot, is a revival of religious humanism. Um, but what is essential for that is the institutional embodiment of religious experience and sensibility. It has been my thesis throughout these lectures that spirituality flourishes and endures best when it takes on institutional form with accompanying patterns of worship, ethics, corporate life, and service to the wider community. But this institutional embodiment of spirituality also must entail some degree of orchestration with the secular institutions of society. This is especially true and challenging for societies with advanced social systems, which, as social theorists from Marx to Talcott Parsons, have insisted are chiefly characterized by the differentiation and relative independence of the various spheres of society. So when I use the word orchestrate to suggest what I have in mind, I mean that increasingly relatively independent institutions of modern societies must work harder to position themselves conceptually in relation to other institutions that have different yet overlapping functions and goals. There always will be some institutionally free-floating spiritualities in modern societies, and they will play their creative role. But the spirituality of modern societies must not be completely spontaneous, individual, and deinstitutionalized. Spirituality must have religious institutional embodiment to have a genuine and long-lasting impact on the lives of individuals and society. I think you've seen that thesis beginning to emerge, especially in the last two lectures. The orchestration of the relation of institutions also should account 
for appropriate degrees of distance between institutions. Talcott Parsons understood this, even with regard to the role of the mental health disciplines. At the same time, he posited the need for a common value system at the highest symbolic level of complex societies that influenced the commitments of its more discrete sectors, he also saw the need for degrees of institutional independence. This is especially true for the psychotherapists, the psychiatrists, and the mental health disciplines in general. When a client goes to a therapist, he does not expect the therapist to represent his father or mother. The client wants a little distance from these family figures. Not so much, I hope, to become alienated from them as to gain the elbow room to sort out and improve his relationships to them and other people. This is why Parsons believed in specialized pastoral counseling for those who are specialized pastoral counselors. He believed that many troubled church people with psychological problems would do better with a counselor in a specialized setting who both had some degree of continuity with the beliefs, values, and symbols of the client's church, but one also with some social distance from that confessing body. Parsons advanced a very convincing sociological justification for the rise of the modern-day pastoral counseling movement, achieving this twofold position of continuity and differentiation by pastoral counselors with reference to church and family is an example of what I mean by institutional orchestration. We do not currently talk much about the importance of institutions in either psychotherapy or contemporary talk in spirituality. With the possible exception of family therapy, we do not develop theories of institutions in psychotherapy, at least not that I have noticed. Much of therapy is designed to help individuals rearrange their emotions in relation to various institutional attachments, especially family and job. Even in couple or family therapy, there is little work on the institution of marriage, the relation of marriage to the law, or even the legal and institutional aspects of family formation and family dissolution. The same is true for our talk about spirituality. Although much spirituality is embodied in institutions, churches, temples, synagogues, denominations, and traditions with official leaders, doctrines, and systems of individual and uh, social ethics, much of modern spirituality gets discussed and analyzed independently of institutional embodiment. So without going so far as to say either the mental health disciplines, psychology, social work, and psychiatry, or the new spiritualities are anti-institutional, it is safe to say that the theory and function of institutions are not their central concerns. But there are modern disciplines that are quite interested in the purpose and task of institutions. I'm arguing that the mental health disciplines and the new interest in spirituality should be so as well. So should the religious science conversation that centers around these movements. Institutional theory should be a part of the science-religion discussion, especially if it is to contribute to revived and socially effective religious humanism. Because of my extensive work from the early 1990s to 2003, on the Religion, Culture, and Family Project located at the University of Chicago, I increasingly became interested in the role of institutions, religious, legal, and economic, in, shame, in shaping family formation and well-being. Although much of law itself, especially family law, is drifting into a kind of anti-institutionalism, which I'll try to demonstrate in my lecture tomorrow night, Several major theorists in law, such as Milton Regan, Margaret Brennick, and Eric Posner, have developed elaborate theories about how institutions shape and stabilize individual, family, and group life, generally, although not always, for the good.
The University of Chicago is the home of individualistically oriented rational choice economic theory associated with the names of Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman. It is also the house and home of what is called the new institutional economics that celebrates the signaling and channeling and covenant building functions of institutions, a school of economics associated with the Nobel Prize winner Ronald Coase. Coase's work is having an impact on family law, not a profound one, but a, a uh, discernible one, especially in the work of Margaret Brennick and her legal views of marriage, family formation, and what counts for child well-being. I remind you that the philosopher Kwame Apia made a very interesting observation in response to moral psychologists who claim that our moral decisions are primarily shaped by pre-reflective emotional intuitions with little influence from higher levels of deliberation. Although Apia is somewhat skeptical of such claims, he wisely points out that even if they are true, they might argue all the more for the importance of settled and tested institutions that would guide moral thinking on the basis of accumulated and examined experience. This lecture will argue for more reflection about the nature of institutions and their orchestration with regard to the mental health disciplines of psychiatry and its relation to religion and culture. This issue too should be part of conversations between religion and science. I will continue the institutional investigation in my concluding lecture tomorrow night on the relation of contemporary marriage and family therapy to present day trends in family law. The struggle of psychiatry to define itself in relation to science on the one hand and culture on the other illustrates why institutional factors are so important in determining whether the science-religion dialogue will contribute or detract from a revised and revived religious humanism. Because psychiatry is a medical specialty practiced within the general field of medicine, it generally has assumed a vital tie between mental health and the body. But there are times when it has emphasized psyche more than body as a seat of mental health. Eric Kandel contends that prior to World War II, psychiatry in the U.S. was mainly rooted in biology. During and after World War II, it largely abandoned its biological roots and assimilated the insights of psychoanalysis and adopted Freud's mid-career shift to interpretation and the efficacy of the talking therapies. Around the early 1980s, American psychiatry has shifted once again from the psyche and moved toward the brain and body. Neuroscience is increasingly at the center of psychiatry. Gerald Maxman, in his new psychiatry, announced that no longer were the psyche, problems of living, and the talking therapies at the center of psychiatry. Psychiatry, he claimed, had lost interest in mental health. Rather, it is principally concerned with the treatment of mental disorders. Since, to be honest, he claims nobody knows what mental health is. He also claims that psychiatry is inept at addressing what is frequently referred to as problems of living. Furthermore, as a professional especially, psychiatry has no expert knowledge whatsoever, he claims, about the purpose of life. Maxim thought that psychopharmacology and the various versions of the DSM diagnostic codes had made psychiatry simultaneously more scientific and also more humble. The talking cures, he claimed, were only one among a battery of possible interventions for psychiatrists. And Maxim believed that psychiatrists were no better at addressing problems of living with psychotherapy than psychologists, social workers, ministers, or maybe even bartenders. In discussions with my psychiatric friends, I have come to believe that Maxim is reasonably accurate in his description of the state of psychiatry today. It follows then that this medical specialty 
is left with two issues to face. First, if psychiatry is about mental disorders and not about mental health or happiness, how does it as a profession relate to these more positive goals for living? Second, how does psychiatry, with this more restricted self-understanding, relate to other institutions such as religion, law, and moral systems that have in the past addressed health, happiness, and the purposes of life? I hold that it is not enough for psychiatry to follow Maxim's renunciation of responsibility for these broader areas of life. The psychiatric profession has had enormous culture-making power. The frameworks the psychiatry uses to conceptualize their practices reflect back onto society, indirectly shaping understandings of life, its goals, and its purposes. It can renounce being the high priest of society defining health and happiness, but nonetheless, inadvertently, still end in substituting new and untested views on these matters. For instance, if the legal profession holds that law, like at the marketplace, primarily should be ordered by rational choice economic considerations, as the so-called law of economic scholars that hold, then a calculative and material view of life may spread to those sectors of society which are touched by lawyers, courts, and legislatures, and from there almost to every nook and cranny of life. By analogy, if psychiatry and psychiatric practice reduces psyche to brain and biology, then this profession may unwittingly flatten life to these material forces, making both morality and religion difficult to conceptualize. In summary, Maxim's solution leaves psychiatry without ways to position itself in relation to other institutions and traditions concerned with health and human purpose. In addition, since Maxim wrote his book, Psychiatry has spread its use of psychopharmacology beyond schizophrenia and clinical depression to additional forms of human stress by altering the functions of the brain rather than by changing habits and attitudes toward life. The view of human nature assumed by this intervention may be spreading throughout our society as well. There are difficulties with a view of psychiatry, I suggest calling it humanistic psychiatry, that imagines it should directly address positive goals of life such as health, happiness, and purpose. In various ways, this view made psychiatry into a positive culture with religious and ethical overtones, a role it was not philosophically prepared to assume. I have argued elsewhere that Freud's near cosmological theory of life and death instincts bordered on a quasi-religious view of life. It contained images of the ultimate context of experience and implications for attitudes of skepticism and restraint that Philip Reif summarized with the phrase psychological man. Eric Fromm had one of the most expansive views of psychiatry. His synthesis of psychoanalysis with the Frankfurt School of Neo-Marxism would have made psychiatry into a social reform movement. Eric Erickson's concept of mental health as generativity had strong resonances with positive models of moral selfhood found in the teleological tradition associated with Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. Object relations theory in general with the exception of Melanie Klein, seems riddled with deep metaphors suggesting that generosity and trust are at the core of human life. Heinz Kohut exhibited a similar ontology of trust in his later thinking. He believed that his self-psychology implied a view of life that he summarized with the concept of tragic man in contrast to Freud's guilty man, whereas Freud's guilty man implies a world of conflict and recrimination between the generations, Kohut's tragic man assumes a harmonious world of mutual self-actualization between the old and the young, a harmony, a harmony similar to that found 
in the so-called humanistic psychologies. I enlist these views not to attack them, but to argue how easy it is for psychiatry and psychiatric concepts to slide over into ethics, ontology, quasi-religion, and positive philosophies for the guidance of society. It is more difficult to avoid introducing into psychiatry implicit ontologies of life and views of fulfillment than people like Maxman tend to think. A psychiatry that claims to attend only to how the brain shapes moods and behaviors can easily end suggesting that nothing but neurons influence feelings and actions. Furthermore, the belief that psychiatry is morally and metaphysically neutral can give rise to a kind of negative moral and religious nihilism that sets at odds with Western culture, that sets psychiatry at odds with Western cultural and religious sources. Unless psychiatry explicitly states that neuroscience cannot account <clears throat> for all of individual and social behavior, its silence on the additional factors that shape the psyche can imply that there is, in fact, nothing more. For psychiatry to remain silent on such matters is to contribute to reductionism by default. Without addressing its relation, its orchestration, to American religious institutions, psychiatry risks alienating itself from American people and their religious cultural traditions. Rather than encouraging the critical reappropriation of religious traditions in the form of a revived religious humanism, psychiatry, in its new scientific narrowing, may function to undermine religions and inadvertently contribute to the hardening of religious traditions and to reactive and potentially destructive fundamentalisms. It can do this by simply allowing chemical and mechanical explanations of the mind to function as metaphors, representing the final and determinative context of experience, allowing these concepts to symbolize all that there really is, all that really counts. There is actual empirical evidence suggesting American psychiatry's attitudes toward religion have contributed, contributed to, the, to alienating this profession from a significant portion of the American religious public. Religious research, I should say, by psychiatrist David Larson and his associates show that whereas as recently as the mid-80s, 90% of Americans believe in God, only 43% of American psychiatrists held those beliefs. Even then, a much higher percentage than was the case for psychologists and social workers. Larson believed that such statistics suggest a significant cultural divide between psychiatry and perhaps many U.S. mental health professions and the general American population. Furthermore, Larson's team found in a survey of over 2,000 articles in four leading psychiatric journals between 1978 and 1982 that only 59 papers contained a quantitative measure of religion and only three treated religion as a major emphasis. A small number of articles that did major religion used what Larson calls a weak or static measures, namely the measure of denominational affiliation. These authors conclude that psychiatric theory during that period viewed religion as a secondary derivative or structural psychic process. In doing this, it has tended to disregard more complicated models of religion found in the work of such scholars as Mac Weber, or William James, Clifford Gertz, Eric Erickson, Heinz Kohut, and Anthony Wallace. Recent changes in the DSM-4 that take a more positive view of the possible adaptive potential of religious practices and subsequent work by Larson and others on the contribution of spirituality to mental health suggest that psychiatry may be changing its attitude somewhat toward religion. But I believe it still has a long way to go both at the level of practical attitude and the level of scientific research, 
American psychiatry may be sowing unnecessary seeds of suspicion between itself and large sectors of the religious population that it hopes to serve. This may explain the rise of alternative religiously based systems of mental health delivery, such as Christian psychiatry, Christian psychotherapy, spirituality, spiritually oriented psychological counseling, and specialized pastoral counselors. Such movements may be happening within the context of other religious traditions as well. People may be searching for mental health providers who they can trust at the spiritual level. Larson joined as researchers such as H. Koenig and M. McCulloch to assess the religious benefits of religion. These investigations, still in their infancy but increasingly more sophisticated, should not be ignored by psychiatry in particular and the public in general. If empirical research continues to show that people who understand themselves to be religious and who participate in religious institutions also have less depression, enjoy better life satisfaction in their work, have better interpersonal relationships, are more generous with their philanthropy, volunteer their time more, live longer, smoke and drink less, or live longer even if they have these habits, then psychiatry, in the name of promoting health, would not want to do anything that would, in principle, alienate people from religious institutions. It might instead want to seek a variety of practical alliances with religion, especially in the mental health and ministries of religious institutions. If psychiatry needs to orchestrate its institutional life in relationship to religion and its various institutional expressions, it should articulate a public philosophy. The purpose of this public philosophy would be to clarify psychiatry's self-definition and its relationship to various aspects of society, including its spiritual and religious aspects. Whether psychiatry defines itself narrowly around mental disorder or broadly around health and fulfillment, it should locate its specialization in relationship to other institutional spheres, such as law, ethics, and religion. The idea of a public philosophy for, psychi for psychiatry first emerged when I chaired a task force in the 1980s of psychiatrists, theologians, and historians on the topic of the relation of religion and psychiatry. The idea of a public philosophy for psychiatry evolved from the deliberations, conferences, and books produced by this research group. The concept of a public philosophy included but went beyond a code of professional ethics. Professional ethics governs a specific context of psychiatrists in relation to patients, but a public philosophy attempts to define the special focus and limits of psychiatry with reference to other spheres and activities of complex societies. Of course, it was easier for our group back in those days to accept the need for such a philosophy than it was to articulate its actual substance. In some ways, at this early stage, the image of such a philosophy was more that of a public dialogue than a single and unified stance. It was agreed, however, that progress was possible and psychiatry's relation to religion should be one of its central interests because of their overlapping concerns with healing. What are some sources for a public philosophy for psychiatry? Here I return to my first lecture where I argued that the dialogue between religion and psychology should proceed within the generous context of a critical hermeneutical philosophy that emphasizes the priority of understanding and the subordinate yet essential role for scientific distantiation and explanation. I relied most on Paul Ricoeur's enrichment of Gadamer's hermeneutic philosophy by building within it the, necessary, the necessity of natural scientific distance and explanation. Starting with the priority 
of interpretation and understanding of the massive historical forces that have already formed us. I recommended resisting foundationalism as a philosophy to guide the science religion conversation. I claim that we can never reinvent the richness of our inherited cultural, ethical, and religious histories by forgetting the source and using science to create de novo our culture, morality, and worldview. But in this lecture, I will supplement hermeneutic philosophy with American philosophical pragmatism. Pragmatism will help us mediate the explanatory findings of the natural and social sciences to the interpretive understandings of hermeneutics. How can this happen? How can pragmatism and hermeneutics live together to both inform the religion science conversation and help develop a public philosophy for psychiatry? Answering this question is the purpose of the remaining portions of this lecture. It can be argued that all American psychiatrists are philosophical pragmatists in their hearts. Pragmatism, better than any other philosophy, probably best accounts for the judgments made in the clinical psychological disciplines. It was the case with Charles Peirce, William James, and John Dewey, as was the case with these figures. American psychiatrists are interested in how theory impacts experience, especially the experience of patients. Pragmatists believe cognitive and moral knowledge emerge out of practice and return to and are tested by the realities of practice. For the purpose of my argument about how pragmatism and hermeneutics can inform a public philosophy for psychiatry, I am mainly interested in pragmatism's view of religion, especially that view developed by William James. James's philosophical approach to religion offers much to psychiatry and can, as well, help bridge the space between philosophical hermeneutics and pragmatism, interpretation, and explanation, understanding, and functionalism. James teaches that it is philosophically more sound to be interested in the consequences of religion than its origins. In the first chapter of the Varieties of Religious Experience, James admits that many forms of religious experience seem to be associated with pathological psychological states, developmental disorders, and sexual conflicts. Had he been alive today, he probably would have included Freud's wish fulfillment, cognitive science interest in the so-called hyperactive agency detective detection devices had, or the neural changes associated with mystical or transcendent, experience, transcendent experiences of the kind investigated by Andrew Newberg. But James claimed that the causal factors which may in part shape the origins of human experience, including religious experience, do not constitute the philosophical grounds upon which the value and truth of that experience can be judged. James used the terms medical materialism for the view that a religious experience is nothing but its prima facie causal conditions, which appear to scientists as originating in developmental conflicts, neurological errors, or observable changes in the brain, at least to some scientists. He found this kind of reductionism quite prevalent in the psychiatry of his day. We see both hard and soft forms of it even in our own time, especially in those scientific endeavors most influenced by psychopharmacology and some, certainly not all, forms of cognitive neuroscience. James, first of all, approached religion with his own brand of phenomenology. As I pointed out in my first lecture, it was not Gadamer's or Ricoeur's brand of phenomenology. From their perspectives, James would be viewed as neglecting the role of myth, metaphor, narrative, and symbol, and history in mediating religious experience. As a matter of fact, however, historical research has shown, has demonstrated, that James was a major source for the phenomenological philosophy of Edmund Husserl and thereby the entire European 
existential phenomenological movement that Husserl indirectly inspired. In this way, James is in the background of Gadamer and Ricoeur as well. Frequently, it has been overlooked that James' pragmatic approach to religion was built on a non-reductive phenomenological beginning point. Psychiatrists should notice that he began his analysis of religion by describing as thoroughly as possible the thick sense of objective presence and meaning that accompanies much religious experience. James did not overlook the psychological and even neurological conditions of religious experience, but he never treated them as exhaustive causal accounts of religious phenomena. Although the full scope of psychodynamic interpretations of religion was not available to James at the time, we can be certain that he would have used them, but never in ways that unfeated his first concern to describe religion phenomenologically. But James was just as interested in assessing the consequences of religious experience as he was in describing it. This is where we see his pragmatism in full force. Before examining the consequences of religious or spiritual experience, he treated it phenomenologically. That is the point that I want to keep in mind, and I want you to keep in mind. This is the difference between James' functionalism and so many other functionalist options in the social sciences. Furthermore, he developed a powerful philosophical reinforcement to support his phenomenology. James located the descriptive or phenomenological moment of religion under the rubric of what he called radical empiricism. James took experience seriously. Experience, in the radical sense, was first of all for him a complex of web of felt meanings rather than a collection of sense impressions as it was for Locke or external reinforcements as it later was for B.F. Skinner or neural findings as it is for some neuroscientists. James' philosophical pragmatism, however, is distinguishable from his radical empiricism. His pragmatism assumed his radical empiricism and his respect for the phenomenological beginning point. But his pragmatism as such was actually more concerned with the consequences of our propositions about and interpretations of these experiences. James was particularly interested in the consequences of claims, propositions, and interpretations of religious experience. James' radical empiricism allowed him to describe religion non-reductively. His pragmatism made him interested in the practical truth and value of religion, its web of consequences in enhancing a range of other goods, such as health, a sense of security, wealth, and general well-being. His pragmatism, as Kenneth Pargament has wisely stated, influences the philosophical background of much of our social science study of religion today. James, however, had a threefold test for the value and truth of religious experience that a public philosophy for psychiatry should keep in mind. These three criteria or tests for the truth and value of religious experience were immediate luminousness, number two, philosophical reasonableness, and number three, moral fruitfulness. James actually held that these three criteria make up what he called spiritual judgments. The immediate luminousness of the experience counts for something in the evaluation of religion. If people claim their religion enlightens them, this testimony should be taken seriously as one important aspect of the assessment. In addition, the immediacy of the experience is where James's brand of phenomenological psychology comes to bear. The media testimony of these experiences, their meaning and illumination should be for both social scientists and psychiatrists descriptive beginning points in their study as well as a criterion for evaluating their possible truth and value. But the criterion of immediate luminosity is not sufficient all by itself. 
a public philosophy struggling to relate itself to religious claims and institutions would not find that sufficient in and of itself as well. It must be supplemented, James said, by a second test, the general philosophical reasonableness of the religious claims, its consistency with other commonly accepted states of knowledge, which James in one place called the rest of what we hold as true. This principle should not be read in a foundationalist manner. The rest of what we hold as true is not to be viewed as immutable a priori truths or irrefutable findings of experimental science. In James's view, this had more to do with our fund of more or less experientially tested and assumed hypotheses about how the world and society works. When claims based on spiritual experiences go too far beyond this commonly accepted fund of hypotheses, James would say there are grounds to be skeptical. The moral fruitfulness, James' third criterion, is the most important of the three for a public philosophy of psychiatry. With regard to religious experiences or claims, here we are asked to weigh, not its origin, but the way in which it works on the whole. And James' phenomenology and functionalism are joined. He holds together the concern to describe experience non-reductively, the phenomenological move, and the concern to assess how the experience functions in individual and communal life, the functional move. This happens because of his insistence that religious experience should not too rapidly be reduced to its associated conflicts, pathologies, human needs, human wants, or celebrated brain states, or correlated brain states. What, however, does moral fruitfulness mean more specifically? In making the moral a partial judge, not the exclusive judge, but a partial judge of the religious, James takes a step in the direction of Kant and most modern liberal thought about religion. Because he held moral fruitfulness in tension with immediate luminousness and philosophical reasonableness, he did not reduce all evaluation of religion to the moral point of view. In addition, James had a much richer concept of the moral than did Kant, one much closer to recurrent emphasis on the priority of the good or the right of ethics over morality, or Louis Janssen's, as he would say it, the priority of the premoral in relationship to the moral. James saw ethics as guiding the actualization of fundamental psychobiological needs. But humans have more needs, both high and low needs, than can be easily organized with one another. At this point, I think, James would agree with the moral intuitionists such as Jonathan Haidt and Joshua Green. Being the evolutionary thinker that he was, he would have little trouble with the idea that humans have very primitive intuitions about such things as good, bad, danger, purity, and disgust, ideas we reviewed in earlier lectures. But he also re reassert the main point. Our needs and various primitive evaluations can and do conflict. Therefore, deliberation, as well as society's inherited ethical systems, are needed to hierarchicalize these moral intuitions so that the more efficacious ones are held supreme and expressed in ways that are compatible with the needs of other people and society as a whole. This last concern about justice, this last concern, I should say, made justice central to morality for James, just as it did for Kant. But James advocated a justice that guided the satisfaction of human needs and desires and the realization of human flourishing. It was a kind of religious humanism, indeed a kind of religious humanism. Or, to use Ricoeur's concept, justice guides and critiques our teleological search for the goods of life. From the perspective of the interests of psychiatry as profession and institution, justice, as James saw it, helps actualize mental and physical health. But by the same token, health for James is never completely disconnected from justice or allowed to trumpet the religious experience of individuals 
should be evaluated, not by its origins, but by its consequences. And these consequences should be judged in part by the degree to which they shape the whole moral pattern of a person's life as he lives with others so that all people can justly fulfill their respective needs as well. James' perspective on religion, especially when supplemented with Ricoeur's more mature hermeneutic phenomenology, can contribute to a public philosophy for psychiatry in its needs to articulate its attitude toward religion. It helps answer the charge that one psychiatrist recently made to the senior psychoanalyst in his community. The psychiatrist said, you know, of course, this religion stuff is all garbage. <clears throat> the senior analyst did not agree, although he was fully aware that sometimes religion can become distorted. The senior analyst confided in me that, in his judgment, it goes far beyond the epistemological competence of psychiatrists as profession to make the metaphysical judgment that all religion is useless fantasy or make the moral judgment that all religion is morally pernicious. James can help psychiatry resist these intellectual traps, traps that could easily spread from the books of the so-called new atheists to the helping disciplines, including psychiatry. James's respectful attitude to religion also makes sense clinically. How is this so? Well, if James and Kant would agree that respecting persons gets to the core of moral behavior. Without invoking Kant or James, many modern psychotherapists who are, are aware that respect for persons when dynamically mediated gets to the heart of psychological cure, a point, in my main, in my a point that I have made in my discussion of Rogers, Freud, Kohut, and others in Lecture 4. Actually, I made it, but I skipped that part so you didn't hear it. Many modern therapists have unknowingly, unknowingly turned Kant's imperative to treat persons as ends and never only as means into a strategy of care and cure. But if his respect is to be administered psychodynamically and be more than a vague attitude, it must be known and shown, as Paul Ricoeur has argued, concretely with reference to a person's narrative self, a person's identity, or the story that tells about herself with all of its interjects, attachments, and conflicting needs and selves. And frequently, crucial aspect of a person's narrative identity is his or her religious experience. Hence, respecting the self of a patient should also entail respecting her conscious and unconscious religious identity and the narratives that he or she tells to reinforce it. Even if one later helps assess its consequences for the person's life. Hence, psychiatry should learn to take a person's religious identity and narrative seriously. It should also work on orchestrating its practice into a fruitful relation to other institutions of society, including religious institutions. To accomplish this, it should assess, assume responsibility for developing a public philosophy for psychiatry, one that would, among other objectives, attempt to clarify its relation to religious institutions. It has been my argument in this lecture and impl implicitly throughout the entire series that the combined resources of a critical hermeneutic philosophy and aspects of American pragmatism can be positive resources for the science-religion dialogue and, in this case, the need for a public philosophy for psychiatry. In my final lecture, to be delivered tomorrow evening, I will carry further my reflections on the need for an institutional dimension in the science and religion conversation by illustrating the issues between marriage and family counseling 
and recent trends in contemporary American family law. Thank you very much. Do we have time for discussion? I'm going to stand up because I think it might project. I think there's a, a live microphone here that helps a little bit. All right. As is our custom, we have a period of uh, question and answer. Um, the microphone is uh, for recording purposes, so please uh, wait until you have the microphone uh, before you to ask your question. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I was fascinated by your um, argument that because religion has such good consequences, psychiatrists ought to uh, pay attention to it and not get themselves cut off from it. Uh, good consequences a good deal of the time. A, a good deal of the time. It also has bad consequences, too, as, as we know. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate that point a little bit more uh, in uh, conjunction with the, the new atheists that you uh, mentioned, yeah. uh, who have all sorts of other things to say about uh, religion that... Uh, uh, ignore the consequences, the good consequences. Well, inside. I think the new atheists do two things that might be attractive to some psychiatrists. I've certainly lectured before psychiatrists who only saw the negative consequences of, of religion in the lives of people that were seriously disturbed or what they considered to be the negative consequences. That's all the only image they had. And, um, and so I think people that go into it with that attitude like the that psychiatrist who spoke to the senior analyst, you know, this religion is garbage, could be susceptible to the arguments of the new atheists. I summarize the arguments of the new atheists along the following lines. They actually use some of the same intellectual resources that increasingly is informing psychiatry, especially in its more neuroscience forms. Evolutionary theory, evolutionary theories of the mind, kind of functionalism along with that, etc. But if you look at their examples of religion, um, almost all of these writers, whether it's Dawkins, Dennett, Harris, or Hitchens, tend to illustrate once again, like some psychiatrists do, only the negative aspects and manifestations of religion. Islamic terrorism is one of their favorite ones. Um, fundamentalism in any of its forms is one of their favorite ones. And they very seldom take on um, mainline or classic forms of any of these religions. They just criticize more moderate and balanced forms for continuing to protect religion, not coming down hard enough on its distortions, and therefore not coming down hard enough on itself. They, he criticizes them. They criticize the classic forms as creating an atmosphere of tolerance, which supports distortions, but they develop very few arguments that actually relate to um, the um, main thought of these uh, religious traditions. For people in psychiatry or any of the mental health professions that um, tend to see only pathological manifestations of religious in their practice, uh, these arguments could be influential, I, I would think, and that would take psychiatry even into a more alienating position with regard to the rest of um, society, at least in its present form. Where even though a lot of people, only about 40, maybe less than 40% of people go to religious institutions on a regular basis, the ideational components at the psychic level of the American public is saturated with religious ideation. And you find this in the surveys, maybe even a more evangelical and conservative form than we might think for people who otherwise tend not to do much with religion. So it's a part of their makeup, and it needs to be listened to and, and handled. Uh, on Dennett, uh, since we're talking about the new atheists, uh, Dennett is really clear that most religion has good effects. So if you're going yeah. to list him along with the other people that you mentioned, you, you need to at least make that distinction or something. He's, uh, he's yeah. I, th I think you're right. I've, I've been reading John Hawk recently, and, and um, as a, he, he tends to 
address the other people and, and kind of bracket Dennett. So that remark was a little bit too much influenced by him. I think you're right. He's a, a, a bit more uh, differentiated than some of the other ones. Now, I, I wanted to ask you about James's uh, three criteria, in particular the first one, luminosity. I, um, I've never been happy with James's uh, way of deploying that criterion. It strikes me. Or all three? The, no, the first one, luminosity, the, the vividness of the experience, mm -hmm. its immediacy. Um, um, it doesn't, to me, give a really satisfying explanation for why this counts as a value. So I was eager to hear you speak about that tonight, but I don't think you gave a really good reason either. Um, well, sort of repeated I, I tend to um, interpret that within his uh, broader radical empiricism. And I think it is the, he believes there's a web of meaning there uh, that um, you pay attention to. But it's something analogous, quite frankly, to that distinction between uh, understanding explanation that, and diagnostic, when explanation is seen as diagnostic. Um, and I use the illustration of the medical doctor, who first of all asks you how you're feeling and wants to know what your subjective experience of your well-being is and how you talk about it, and what weight you give to it. Um, and that's important, even though he may run off and give you a CT or, you know, some other kind of, of, um, of a mechanical, more scientific, more distantiated perspective. As you know, some of you know, I've recently gone through quite a, a medical experience myself, and I kept on being fascinated by how repeatedly and how Seriously, they ask the question, how you feel. I think there's something analogous uh, in the immediate luminosity. The person has an experience. I feel as if um, I've had this experience of God. Or I can tell you this one experience that I had. A psychiatrist, I may have mentioned this, one time came to me and said, my, my parents' background was terrible. My family life was awful. My parents were you know, terrible to me, and they were neurotic and drug addicted and everything else, you know. And I started reading the Bible, and especially the New Testament, and God became my parent. And, you know, and then he would go ahead and describe the sense of trust, well-being, security, dependability that he gathered uh, from this image of God from these texts. And, you know, it provided the substitute. Well, I think that's along the line of immediate luminosity that James has in mind. I think he could have given a thicker understanding of it. That's why you hear me say I think he could be enriched by hermeneutic phenomenology and, uh, and kind of unpack that a bit more than he did. He unpacks it rather flatly. I agree with you there. That's why I would nudge him toward a richer phenomenological uh, tradition that tries to unpack these experiences in terms of the way they summarize um, aspects of our effective history, the implicit metaphors that are there, uh, whatever implicit narrative they tell um, or pull out of the experience. I think James could have done more with that than he did. Do you mind if I come back? Uh, yeah, please do. Um, if James had meant that there's something simply intrinsically valuable about someone's subjective experience, I believe he would have mentioned it in those terms. He would have talked about subjective experience. But when he talks about um, luminosity, or um, he's after something different. He's after actually something partially cognitive. And cognitive? Partially cognitive, yes. When he speaks about luminosity, he's talking about the, the clearness with which the reality that he thought was somehow down underneath was showing up to you um, in that experience. So it's not really the analogy that you're talking about, I don't think. That, that analogy has got to do with simply someone's testimony, someone's experience as being relevant to who they are and what things mean. Yes, but when, when James chooses the words he chooses, he's after something cognitive or informational about reality itself. That's what I don't think he develops very well, and I was expecting you to say something about that. Yeah. Well, um, I think probably his um, concept of um, immediate luminosity is also very much um, influenced by his earlier work on mysticism. And, um, and I'm sympathetic to that work, especially his desire 
to point out that in mystical experiences, we have a more unitive experience, broaden our ego boundaries and things like that. But then I'd come back and try to fill both concepts up in slightly different ways than James did. And I, you could probably push me easily in that direction. Uh, I had a question uh, about, um, I guess this is also about generally the uh, critical hermeneutical method that you've been describing since the first lecture, but also maybe more specifically as, as you uh, are recommending it to psychiatry. Uh, to what extent do you think uh, the insider's perspective is important for the practice of this method? I mean, to what extent do psychiatrists have to have... Um, uh, some uh, experience within the tradition that they're applying these these um, uh, criteria to? Well, I think it does help if you take the, the strict contours and meaning of, of um, God and Marian hermeneutic philosophy. Um, you are fed by a tradition and its effective history, and then you, but you don't know where a lot of this stuff comes from. It's just kind of in your bones. And when you go back and look at it more concretely, you're looking something that not is a distant object, it's something that's already part of you, but you don't really fully understand it, and you look at it. James, I, I think, I think Ricoeur would say that most psychiatrists functioning in American cultural and social life, even if they are Hindus, and they have a Christian patient, have internalized some of that effective history uh, of the more concretely practicing Christian that stands in front of them. The Indian has been shaped by English colonization and all the things that went into that, you know, and it's not something that is totally and completely foreign, even though he may not know where it came from but certain aspects of, the, of his law, certain aspects of the organization of society have seeped in from that, that tradition. So it may be more complex, but it's to say that it's entirely, he's entirely the psychiatrist, the Indian psychiatrist is entirely external, um, may be an overstatement in view of the complexities of um, interreligious um, interaction uh, in our today's world. To come back, though, I don't think it's absolutely necessary that you be deeply internal. Okay? If you take the hermeneutic point of view, it's still a dialogue, even though you may be pretty much removed from the beginning points of the other person. Any other questions? Well, uh, before you go, let me just say that there there are some uh, light refreshments uh, outside the doors here. So I, I hope you may uh, take some time to linger and talk more uh, with uh, Dr. Browning. And um, once again, uh, join me in thanking Browning for his, his lectures tonight. Thank you. Uh, are there any psychiatrists or other mental health professionals here? Huh? Actually, oh, yeah, I yeah. I mean, if, <laughs> that was what I was afraid of. Well, I, you know, if there are anybody close to those, I like you can tell me, you know, if anything like this kind of conversation could ever get started uh, in those professions. <laughs>